Okay, so I know most of you may know about this film from the 80s called They Live. It's pretty famous within conspiracy circles, but I've watched this a couple times throughout my life and every time I see it with new eyes. The movie is honestly amazing. It starts out with your traditional 80s action movie and you're basically following this guy who, through a seemingly random sequence of events, finds these glasses that have special properties. These glasses allowed him to see the world for what it really is. He could see past the realm of illusion and see the other truths and things. He could see messages seem to contribute to the sleepwalking state that modern humanity has been caught up in. These messages such as obey and reproduce subconsciously weigh people down to material reality. The weirdest part about the glasses though is that they allow him to see that many human beings look quite different when he wore them. They look like demons or some sort of reptilian-like entity, imitating or impersonating a human being. At first, the reptilian-like humans tell him to stop staring and, you know, they think nothing of it. But then they start realizing that he can actually see them. So the cops begin to try and arrest him. The movie is a ride of an experience and I highly recommend it to anyone who hasn't seen it. There's a sense of sincerity to the film as if it's exposing some sort of hidden truth. On top of that, the directing is just very unique and it's just a one-of-a-kind film. The director who wrote it says that it's a documentary, which is really interesting when you tie it together with the work of Dr. Kilner. Supposedly, these glasses are based on a true story. In the 1920s, a scientist named Walter Kilner experimented with a dark blue chemical dye called dicyanin, which he poured into a glass screen, and when he gazed through the screen, he found that he was able to see the aura of a person standing in front of him. He was able to see the person's aura because the specific color of the dye blocked out a large portion of the white light spectrum. This left only a small portion which helped concentrate his perception of the aura. Now this gets interesting because supposedly in the 1940s they decided to make this dye illegal. Dicyanin is not a drug, it's not toxic, and it's made from coal tar. However, it's as if it's been erased from our knowledge because there's little information on the subject. The reason they wanted to hide it is because it allowed anyone to see into the astral. You didn't have to be sensitive or have to train in meditation. This knowledge needed to be suppressed in order to train and program future generations. Is there some sort of cover up? Listen to this story about vets who were seeing demons with old military tech. To launch something, yeah. yeah. So that means that they've had uh, about uh, 30 years to tweak this stuff, wherever. And I know that this, right, and I know that this stuff exists because my father's uh, role in the military brought him very close to it many times. So my father did three tours in the uh, Vietnam War. And in his second tour, he was advanced enough in rank, and he was there, I think, 11 or 12 months. And when he was in country at that point, he was a, uh, he's always been a field officer and uh, came up uh, in the military through the Korean War in a battlefield commission. And so, you know, the military likes guys like him, and they let him be in charge of a couple of different projects. One of the projects that he was in charge of at the time was these uh, technology, this technology that they introduced into Vietnam that uh, almost brought the war to a standstill. Wow. And th this technology was a uh, night vision goggle, but it's not night vision as we have it now, okay, uh, because the night vision goggle was done in the red spectrum. And so when my father came back from Vietnam... You mean infrared or... No, 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 I'll explain. Ordinary red. Oh, ordinary red, okay. Mm. So instead of seeing... When you look at a night vision goggles now, you see green. Everything is right. translated uh, into green for you. Mm. And human eye sees green, more colors, shades of green than any other color. It's right. part of our evolution, our need to find food. So that's clever then. Correct. But see, here's the thing. It started off as red. Mm. And so the night vision goggles were introduced to helicopter uh, pilots and uh, gunnery people in Vietnam. And I, I won't hesitate as to the, I mean, I won't um, guess as to which year it was that they introduced them. But my father was part of this initial experiment mm. with the troops that he commanded. And it was a disaster because the image was presented in red pixels, not green. And because of the te technology being used at that time, it created very interesting effects that they could not deal with. So you had uh, some officers that were part of this um, cadre uh, or this cohort of other officers that were all uh, testing these new technologies for the military that had their troops always use these goggles. And those, those units uh, became self-destructive. They uh, went down in a horrid situation. My father was extremely practical, didn't want to see him uh, himself get destroyed in any way, wanted to return and get out. So as soon as he saw what's going on with these goggles, he had his people take them off. And mm -hmm. he actually got um, 
praise from the military for the way that he dealt with all of this. But the effect was this. A gunner in a helicopter would have no problem using these goggles. And only everything is showing up as a, a sort of a faint reddish image. And it was true night vision the way we have it now. And even a greater depth because you could also flip it and get an extra layer that was sort of yellowish that would be heat signatures as well. And they don't have those combined anymore in these goggles. Anyway, the goggles that were presented to the gunners, and my father tells the story of the very first time they're out with them, and they're flying along and he's in the front of the helicopter with the pilot. And all of a sudden, in a very peaceful area, not anything going on at all, the, the gunner in his, uh, on, the, on the starboard side of his helicopter starts firing wildly at their height, not at anything on the ground, but in an area that he was shooting at and basically causing other helicopters in their little flotilla to have to react. Mm. And, he, and my father goes on back to the, to the gunner, basically demanding, what the hell, dude? What are you shooting at? <laughs> and, the, and the kid is just sweating profusely just and his eyes are just dilated beyond belief and my dad thought he was dealing with another heroin addict but this mm. was before it had gotten really bad in in vietnam and the kid was not exhibiting uh those kind of symptoms he was mm. reacting to what he had seen mm. and he's describing to my father that he was shooting at these basically flying demons that mm. were flying alongside the helicopter and and he knew they were coming to get him because they were gesturing at him and they could see him and so he reacted and he started shooting his Bren gun, uh, you know, big 50 caliber slugs at these things, right? Mm. And they were flying along right next to the helicopter. So he's fly firing out directly from the helicopter and there are other helicopters in the vicinity. So it caused all kinds of problems. And this goes on repeatedly week after week after week. Every time they try and use these, these night vision goggles, at some point they encounter monsters, true monsters. <laughs> now, <laughs> officers had been told not to wear these. Mm. Okay. The, the pilots were told not to wear them. Mm. And, but my dad put them on to see what the hell was, was going on and to hear him describe it. Wow. It was like, like, like being in the worst kind of a demonic gothic hell Jeez. that you'd look out at the tops of trees and you'd see these creatures with big wings and claws and everything come flying off of the tops of the trees. But you take the goggles off and there's not even a disturbance in the yeah. in the fog above the canopy of the trees, right? They're, they're, see, they're perceiving into an aspect of consciousness. Correct. Another dimension. And it was tied to the red image. As soon as right. and so as soon as they went to green, all of this kind of stuff disappeared. Of course, of course, uh, and uh, and we don't have time. To, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> me studying Pythagorean realism and vibrations. We could speak a lot about this, but let's not even go there. But one question: Are these connected to the modern night vision goggles people use to see UFOs? Correct. Third generation or whatever they're called. Oh, that is this the same technology? It's the same technology. It's just that the translation is is done through a different uh, phase alignment, and we're not seeing everything that the goggles could show you. And, and they don't connect it to heat signatures either, right? Organic. They don't do that. And then they also don't do it with a red display. Now, the red red aspect of it is interesting because the, the green display comes from electrons, not photons. Okay, And it comes from an electron transmission. Mm -hmm. Presumably, they were still doing electron transmission. They were just turning it into a red filter. John Walter Kilner worked as a medical electrician at St. Thomas Hospital, London from 1879 to 1893. As you could probably guess from the term medical electrician, he specialized in electrotherapy. He was an MD, BA, and an MB. Kilner attended Cambridge University in England, and by 1833, he was a member of the Royal College of Physicians. His writings covered a wide variety of topics, but the one we are focusing on today is his book, The Human Atmosphere. This book suggests that there is an aura or colorful fringe or outline on each human, and that the color of that fringe can help indicate the mood or wellness of the subject. In the book, Kilner describes how to make the ore visible to anyone, even the untrained neophyte. He does this by placing dicyanin dye between two panes of glass and hermetically sealing it. So let's just pause here for a second and think about the term hermetically sealed. I'm sure by now all of us have heard of the Greek figure Hermes Trismegistus, but what does that have to do with sealing? Let's take a quick look at Otto von Goerich, a man well known by mainstream history as a scientist and politician. His work largely focused on atmospheric pressure, electrostatics, and of course vacuums. It was his invention of the Magdeburg hemispheres that seemed to have popularized the term hermetically sealed. As to why he chose to use the word hermetically, the reason seems to be that it was said in mythology that Hermes has the ability to seal a box or chest in a way that would prevent it from ever opening again much like the strength of the vacuum seal that von Goerich was well known for. Modern science unsurprisingly scorns this type of research and preaches that it is pseudoscience. But there is no way to test this for oneself, as mysteriously, the dye in which this experiment uses is very difficult to get hold of. 
In the experiments, the researchers would view the subject through the screen in the daylight with the dye sealed inside the glass. In his book, Human Atmosphere, Walter explains how he came about finding the dye and explains in detail the different portions of the aura. In order to make this work, two screens were necessary, one containing a solution of spectoranine and alcohol, and a second less dilute. Spectoranine was another term that Walter Kilner used for dicyanine. When looking at the body through the screens, first you see a dark band, not exceeding a quarter of an inch, surrounding and adjacent to the body, without any alteration in size at any part. This he calls the etheric double. The second portion is the inner aura. It is the most densest portion and follows the contours of both female and male bodies. It arises just outside of the etheric double, but it does look as if it touches the body itself. The third portion, the outer aura, commences at the outer edge of the inner aura, and it varies in its size. When the whole aura is observed through the blue dicyanine screen, all the portions seem to be blended together, but the part nearest the body is the most dense. However, if a carmine screen is employed, which is a red dye that he experimented with in order to see more details of the aura, the different portions of the aura become distinguished. He compares many different auras and describes them in detail in his book, such as the difference between a healthy and a sickly aura. This practice should belong to the field of spectroscopy, but it seems as if the field has been covered up in a way so that it's not connected with the occult any longer. Today, analytical spectroscopy is defined by the range of electromagnetic waves interacting with the material such as ultraviolet visible, infrared, x-ray, radio, or microwave frequencies. Using these methods, modern science can obtain information about atoms, molecules, or even stars in the sky. However, it seems all attempts to connect the occult with the subject have been suppressed, such as viewing auras with screens, looking into other worlds, and seeing beings that were not visible before. This goes back to Baron von Reichenbach in the 1800s. He was a German astronomical instrument maker who claimed to see auras around the poles of magnets and around human hands. He is the one who discovered paraffin and other coal tar products in the 1830s. Between 1835 and 1860, he also published a long series of scientific papers on meteorites. His many contributions earned him a well-deserved reputation as a brilliant scientist and industrialist. His colleagues, however, wanted nothing to do with his work on a mysterious forest which he named Odd. We can do a separate video on this topic. Reichenbach documented the reports of sensitives seeing emanations from crystals and magnets in total darkness and detecting alternations of electric current. They could also perceive an aura surrounding the human body. This influenced the work of Kilner, but this technology is most likely not new and has been used in ancient times to communicate with other beings and to see into other realms. Magic mirrors, crystal balls, tinted glass windows in churches. These technologies existed in ages past, but they have now been lost in our modern time. Following the work of Kilner came Harry Boddington in his work, The Development of Clairvoyance and the Scientific Formation of Circles. Quote, While searching for a method of transforming human radiations into terms of color, Dr. Kilner hit upon an original method of diagnosis. In its essential details, it corroborates the statements of clairvoyance and cuts short the long years of preparation at one time thought to be necessary. By utilizing a little known dye called dicyanine, he produced an effect upon the optic nerve which extended normal vision into the regions of the infrared and ultraviolet ends of the spectrum. Radiations like the perfume of flowers and the human aura thus became visible. Following his lines of research, I made an apparatus which obviated much of the expense and all the drawbacks of Kilner's original screen. This was registered under the name of Arospecs. Thus, Kilner opened an avenue to psychic science, although he never personally saw beyond the etheric body. The avenue is led by the most direct route to second sight and has been adopted by spiritualists as the safest and most certain method of development. Watching the aura was found to develop impressionalism of a high order. Many of these impressions being far beyond the capacity of the recipient compel scientists to speculate upon the possibilities of a world of consciousness external to the brain of experimentalists. That the mist and the screens themselves are but a means to an end is proved by the resultant second sight becoming habitual. With steady regular practice, the mind automatically focuses the eye just as normal sight does for a near or distant views. Nearly everybody is able to see the vague shadowy lines of forest termed aura after using Kilner screen with correct lighting. I have publicly demonstrated that about 80% easily register the first stages of auric sight. Density and color become apparent to a few at once, but the majority merely see a gray or black shadow extending from one hand to another. Everyone regards it as an optical illusion until they find that the lines of force can be stretched in every direction. Figures 1 and 2 explain what is seen. 
An optical illusion always retains the same shape and form. The aura will be found to change its shape and color in accordance with mental qualities and health or disease. The fortunate few travel onwards from this point to clairvoyance of an exceptional character." End quote. And then we have stories such as with H.E. Wells, The Crystal Egg, where a shop owner comes to find a strange crystal egg that serves as a window into the planet Mars. H.G. Wells mixes this occult knowledge with the popular sci-fi culture at the time, but these ideas exist within our subconscious because they come from an ancient time when we were more connected with other realms of existence. There's actually a website online where you can buy them from Russia, they're called Prana Glasses, but it looks like they use the same method as Kilner. I don't know, there's some weird stuff on this site, but it seems that they might be for training your eyes to see the etheric realm. They say that you can take them off and still see the aura afterwards for a short period of time. 